well in my observation this is uh, flood was uh, huge uh, as far as uh, its onset and its uh, seasonal timing is concerned usually uh, there are uh, uh, not many examples of uh, so such huge floods uh, occurring so early in the monsoon season it occurred uh, as almost as soon as uh, the monsoons came to the region in the month of June, uh, even when uh, the full monsoon was not established uh, 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 to its full scale uh, all over the region, there was a lot of early rainfall in the northeastern uh, hills, especially in Arunachal Pradesh and Assam. And, uh, as a and, 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 and all this resulted in this catastrophic flood. But then, uh, it was not unusual as well as not unexpected. Although the government was uh, found uh, to be totally unprepared, and almost uh, the government missionary was uh, caught unprepared. But uh, to people who have been uh, studying floods, and uh, weather or climate change for northeastern region, it was not unexpected. This shows that uh, uh, there's lack of understanding, there's a lack of scientific understanding of uh, the patterns of floods, the dynamics of uh, flood rainfall relationship on the part of our government agencies who are. Uh, responsible for flood management. Uh, the situation was uh, made worse because of the breaches in uh, one very important embankment on the Brahmaputra, which is uh, officially known as the CC Tekeli Futa embankment, or some people also call, call it the uh, CC Dyke, uh, which extends for uh, about 100, almost 100 kilometers from uh, Dhamaji district, from upper Dhamaji districts, uh, and continues to Majuli. Now, uh, this embankment, uh, in particular, has played a very important role in protecting people, uh, hundreds of thousands of people, uh, on the north bank of the Brahmaputra. Uh, for about last 50 years. Now, uh, we had studied a part of this uh, embankment uh, near uh, this place called Matmara, and Matmara, we all know that was very infamous for its catastrophic floods and for uh, uh, large scale sand casting as well as uh, riverbank erosion from uh, 2007 to 2010 where uh, ultimately the geotube and geotextile based embankment came. Now that place is protected but uh, during the course of the study that we carried out uh, from 2008 to 2010 we found that uh, in many many places uh, of that embankment uh, which is also part of the same CC dike and also in many of the other important embankments on tributaries of the Brahmaputra and Hamazi Lakhimpu, the status of maintenance and repairing of these embankments is very poor, uh, which is uh, the main reason why these embankments get breached and uh, collapse to the pressures of flood waves in many places. But this time, uh, it was probably unexpected uh, even to a section of the communities. Uh, I personally visited some of these places in uh, the Maji districts uh, in and around the in and around the Moscow Panchayat uh, in the last couple of uh, days, and I uh, found that it was a uh, long bridge that occurred uh, near a village called Bedlang. There, there, there were two important breaches, uh, one at 
a village called Medlang, the one, uh, another at a village called Namdang. And uh, one has to go to these places uh, to believe what has happened to the landscape because of these breaches. And it just reminds me, the situation uh, which I observed uh, after the floods had taken place, reminds me of what I observed in Matmara back in 2007. I think this is the begin beginning of uh, uh, the story of another Matmara. Because uh, a huge uh, amount of, a huge expanse of agricultural land has been deposited with uh, sand. And uh, I can tell you that uh, uh, this is perhaps going to be the repetition of the history of Matmara in these places. And Matmara is not far away from these places. What has happened in Matmara since 2007, when the first large bridge occurred in the Matmara Dike, has also started to happen uh, near the villages called Bedlang and Namdang on the Sisi Dike, uh, which is in the Moscow Panchayat of the Maji district. A huge expanse of land uh, which uh, used to have standing crops during that uh, period, during that month of June. Uh, has been completely destroyed and deposited with uh, almost two to three feet of sand and uh, almost 10 to 11 villages have been very directly very severely affected because of sand casting and the uh, soil uh, is not going to be reclaimed on its own probably in another six to seven years so we can very safely assume that for next six to seven years and maybe for next ten years uh, agriculture as a livelihood of the people will may not be possible for uh, uh, several thousand families in that area uh, but then the question uh, again uh, rises uh, is why embankments are you know uh, breaching so frequently uh, everywhere and if you uh, look back uh, to what has happened during this year floods not only in the Brahmaputra but also in some of its tributaries <coughs> and definitely on the Brahmaputra it has happened mainly because of breaches in embankments although breaching of embankment is uh, almost a part of life of the embankments as with life of the communities in Assam because uh, Preaching of embankment has been very uh, frequent uh, since 1970s and uh, that has uh, emerged as one of the major causes of devastating floods. Now embankments are breaching mainly because uh, of the lack of regular maintenance and monitoring. This is known to everybody, this is known to community, this is known to the local administration, this is known to also researchers like us and uh, uh, definitely it is also not unknown to uh, the departments who are responsible for maintaining embankments. Uh, from the experience of my, my visit to these areas and uh, my uh, consultations with the communities, it has come to like that. People have been complaining about the poor status of embankments in that particular stretch of the CCT Kaliputa type. They have submitted memorandum, they have submitted applications to district local governance authorities, to district administration, even to the ministers as well as uh, local MLA. But nothing had happened. Uh, nobody had attended to their uh, no complaints. and. Uh, some of them had even warned that anything can happen to that stretch of embankment because of the poor state of affairs. And finally this happened. Now it could have been averted if there had been regular monitoring of embankments and regular maintenance. Now this is also a case of not having uh, a good rapport with community uh, on the part of government departments like the Water Resource Department. Because uh, it's only with a good cooperation of 
with communities, local communities, that uh, a good monitoring system can be uh, established for watching the status of embankments. And this goes a long way in actually identifying the vulnerable portions of embankments. And once these portions are uh, identified and uh, brought to light, and then uh, authorities can be, you know, uh, warned about what could happen in the next flood uh, season. So internal migration is something that has been triggered mainly by flood and uh, other water related hazards in Assam. Uh, as a result, uh, you know, it has led to uh, different kind of uh, social interactions and social conflicts uh, which is very typical of uh, scenarios where uh, there are groups of people who are coming or going to new places and then again there are groups of people who have been living in those places then different groups interact and then the uh, dynamics actually determine uh, the level of conflict and finally they settle down. So, we have seen it happening uh, in many places of Assam. People uh, from the Chaur areas, when the Chaur areas are severely affected by flood and uh, erosion, they come to the river banks. Again, many people from who are ousted by flood and reverberation from river banks, they go to Chaur areas. This is very typical of Western Assam. In Eastern Assam, we have seen uh, people, uh, live, uh, indigenous communities of people living in villages, they have left their uh, you know, places of origin, even their places of, uh, uh, even origins of, uh, even their own districts, and they have gone far and wide uh, in search of uh, safe uh, land. And uh, this has actually uh, given rise to you know, uh, many uh, conflicts uh, on many scales. And it is one of those factors that has created a lot of pressure on uh, forest land. Because uh, uh, right now, in the, we can see that there is not much land available, not much uh, uh, fertile and uh, eligible uh, land available for uh, rehabilitation and resettlements of uh, victims. In that case, uh, uh, government has been uh, you know, uh, encouraging people or people on their own uh, have been settling in uh, many areas which are part of preserve forest or in part of other ecologically sensitive areas. So government also has not come up with uh, uh, you know, adequate measures for uh, rehabilitation and resettlement. It's a very practical philosophy for riparian people, people for people living on river banks. Uh, to live with floods or living with floods. In fact, uh, in a state like Assam, people have had to live with floods and they will have to live with floods forever to some extent because it's not possible to control uh, the causes of flooding. It's not possible to control the physical process of flooding uh, fully or completely, what can be done with the application of, uh, with the creative and innovative application of technology, which is also uh, socially acceptable to the people, is to mitigate uh, the impact of flood to a certain extent. Uh, but having said that, living with floods also doesn't mean and should mean that nothing should be done to protect people uh, using structural or other measures and to allow people to experience floods and to allow people to remain open to rivers and then suffer for, from floods. And and, and, and and then continue with this suffering for years. Living with flood doesn't mean that. What it actually means 
is to acquire the capability and capacity to cope with floods on a short term scale and to adapt to flood on a longer term scale. That essentially means to uh, develop certain, certain strategies through which uh, people who are exposed to floods, who experience floods, uh, because of many reasons, should uh, come up with uh, different uh, you know, practices and strategies that can be developed on the basis of their traditional knowledge and uh, the contemporary learning and other local practices through which they can develop resilience which is uh, adequate to help them to recover from the shock of these disasters. In this case, uh, floods. So living with flood is essentially uh, what you call, uh, it, it, it itself is a uh, strategy that uh, encourages people to develop their adaptive capacity to floods. Well then, uh, it's not easy to talk about uh, solutions to the problem of flood. In fact, uh, the solution, word solution, the meaning of the word solution is uh, uh, not actually ap even applicable to uh, a problem or a disaster like floods. There's not something uh, like when we're having a problem and uh, we can do something, the problem will vanish. It's not like that. Uh, flooding is a part of the natural hydrological cycle. It's been happening uh, uh, forever, as it will be happening forever. Now it's all about you know uh, taking appropriate uh, methods, appropriate measures and strategies to uh, reduce the impact of flooding on human societies as well as on uh, ecosystems and environment and even wildlife, why not? Flood solution uh, should not be anthrop only uh, no, uh, anthropogenic in its approach. Uh, the all uh, uh, solution to flood can only mean that we take up such measures, such strategies through which we reduce the impact of flooding on human societies to different extents, depending on the needs and requirements. Uh, now this includes, as far as what we have seen in India, mostly adoption of structural measures through which actually government agencies both at the national and state level have been trying to uh, control flooding which actually means containing uh, the flood wave to protect uh, people on a certain stretch of the river. Now from the very first policy statement of government of India that was uh, announced back in 1953 uh, about flood management till now structural measures have remained uh, the most dominant approach of government agencies to deal with floods. Different kind of structures, mainly magments, which it has been uh, adequately demonstrated that is not adequate, uh, uh, is, 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 is not a permanent uh, uh, solution to the problem. Uh, it keeps respite, embankments and other structural measures provide respite to, to the people or, and, and protect them from floods for a certain period. Uh, but then, these are also measures that uh, produce uh, different kind of impacts on the river and its behavior and the river hydrology, uh, which affect uh, the downstream areas in other ways. That is why uh, it is not enough to have uh, only structural measures because uh, per se and uh, only by adopting structural measures is not possible to contain floods or manage floods adequately to reduce uh, people's flood risk. That is why we need a very appropriate kind of mix of 
uh, structural as well as non-structural majors. Now, uh, government of India or government of Assam or any state government, per se, uh, in Eastern India, uh, have not been following any specific policy for mitigation of other river bond problems. And we have been carrying out uh, from Aranya community-based consultations all over the state. And we have uh, been conducting a workshop on uh, the governance uh, you know, aspect of floods and other water-related issues for a long time. And based on uh, all the recommendations and suggestions that have come from experts, uh, civil society, as well as uh, stakeholders, communities. Uh, it has been, uh, it has come to our observation that uh, the suggestions that have been given all indicate to uh, the formulation of a specific policy at the state level for sustainable and integrated management of flood and river bank erosion. So far, in Assam, we don't have any state level policy for flood and erosion management. Although there are guidelines that are followed by engineers and bureaucrats for managing and controlling floods during the time of disaster, but we don't have any comprehensive and forward looking and adaptive policy. Uh, that is why we think and we highly uh, uh, recommend that Government of Assam should immediately formulate a policy.